All right, we have some people uh, coming in now, which is great. Welcome, welcome. I think on the next event, we'll, we'll add the, the elevator music as we, as we wait to get started. Hi everyone, welcome, uh, welcome to our events. Thank you for joining. Um, we're gonna get started in a few minutes. We just wanna make sure we give uh, everyone some time to, to join. Um, and yeah, make sure you have your questions ready. Um, we'll start with a, uh, an intro uh, about the group, about the event, um, about our, our guest here, David Tuffy. Um, and then we'll open up into the AMA and we'll have questions submitted to through the Q and A um, feature. Um, we'll go through the questions and we'll relay them to, to David. If you guys already have questions that you want to submit, please feel free to add them into the Q&A modal. Um, let us know if you have any challenges there, but uh, um, just submit them through and then we'll be reviewing them as they come in. So for those of you who are just joining, we're going to be getting started in a few minutes. I want to give everyone a little bit of time just to, to join, um, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Um, again, uh, if you have um, kind of how we'll, we'll run the event, <clears throat> we're going to do an intro about the group, about the event. We're going to introduce uh, our, our guest, uh, David Tuffy, um, talk a little bit about his background, and then we'll open it up to you, the attendees, to ask questions about uh, anything uh, related to, to product management. Um, David has 12 plus years in um, product management, so it would definitely be you know, a great opportunity to ask questions um, from everything from um, you know, the hiring process to managing a product team, et cetera. So um, definitely really excited to, to jump in. Uh, again, we'll have all questions are going to be going through the Q&A feature. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them. Um, and then we'll be reviewing them and then we'll relay them to David. Um, currently, everyone is, is muted um, just for kind of keeping uh, things a little organized for the event. Um, and then when we get started, we'll, after the intros, we'll, we'll jump right in. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll connect to um, kind of uncover any issues. See a couple questions already uh, have come in, which is great. Um, so, and David, you can see these as well or? Yep, I can see them. And Blaine, I didn't ask you before, but um, if there are questions we don't get to or things maybe I don't have a good answer to that need to look up, um, can people contact me through the, the meetup uh, messaging? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Great question. Cool. Um, so we'll we'll make sure that uh, we have David's contact information will be made available, um, and then that way you guys will be able to kind of carry on conversations after the event. Um, and and yeah, we want to make sure that uh, you guys get the the most out of the event. Um, David's really really awesome and uh, generous member of the community. So really excited to kind of see all the, the wisdom he's able to share today. Um, so um, 
yeah, we'll, we'll probably, I think it might make sense to just kind of do either through email, um, but also we can post um, follow-ups in the meetup thread. Um, so for each event, um, I think that could be a good way for in case people have missed it, um, um, but we'll definitely make that available. Cool. Um, awesome, so we're just gonna wait one or two more minutes um, just to make sure everyone has time to uh, get settled in and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Um, a lot of great questions coming in here. Um, that's great. So we'll get started at the top of uh, at six six thirty eight on on the dot, um, and we'll we'll jump in. Okay, awesome. So it is uh, 6.38, so we're gonna jump in. Um, so thank you all uh, for joining us. Hi everyone, welcome to the Product Management Nights New York virtual AMA with senior product leader, David Tuffy. Uh, my name is Blaine Stillerman and I am your co-host for the evening. I'm one of the co-organizers of this meetup group and I'm very excited to have you all join us tonight. Uh, Tonight's event is gonna be broken into two parts. First, um, we're gonna do a few intros about the group, about David, um, and then next is the AMA. So to submit questions, please enter them in the Q&A feature um, and we'll sort through and relay them to David. I already see a bunch of questions coming in, which is really great. Um, if you guys have any problems, just feel free to uh, send me a message in the chat or raise your hands and we'll try to have those resolved. As a reminder, please uh, be sure to Keep yourselves muted. I'm not sure if you even have the option to do so. Uh, unmute yourself, but uh, if you do, make sure you stay muted. That way, we just create a um, you know a, a good environment for for us to to speak tonight. Um, and yeah, and we'll, we'll jump in. So to get started, I'd like to share some background about our group. Um, so Product Management Nights New York is a local meetup group created by the Product Management Festival Organization, also known as PMF. And there are hundreds of other events like these around the world, around the country. Um, PMF is dedicated to the global support and development of product managers in all industries and strives to amplify the impact of product management. Um, with the goal of product managers being more successful and influential, um, at the same time, creating real value in their organizations. Uh, so Next up, we'll have David Tuffy introduce uh, himself and share a little bit about uh, his background. Uh, David? Cool. Um, so thanks for the, a little bit of echo, sorry. Thanks for the uh, intro, uh, Blaine. So I'll just give you a high level. Um, I have been in web and mobile technology for uh, as long as you can be in web and mobile technology, pretty much since like .com 1.0. Um, started out in engineering got into kind of operations and project management and got into product management uh, about 12 years ago when I was working at Napster. Uh, not the original um, super fun uh, free music Napster, but the kind of more above board, still pretty fun, but totally legal version of the service. Um, I've been a product manager ever since then, um, working in kind of a series of kind of progressive leadership roles. Um, brief stints at Amex, and then I moved on to um, a few startups where I was either, you know, first in product person or first kind of product lead uh, into the into the organization. So um, that's kind of my general background. Um, I'm happy to go into a little bit more about how I got into product management, but I think that's probably a question that's up there as well. Um, so I can, I can dive into that, um, or we could uh, go into questions if you'd prefer to do that, Blaine. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so that was actually the first question I wanted uh, us to, to dive into. We'd love to hear a little bit more about what uh, what made you want to go into product management. Yeah, um, 
So I'll admit, you know, unlike probably a lot of people here who have been a lot more focused in their careers um, from a younger age, um, the early part of my career was pretty accidental. Um, I came out of college with uh, an engineering and science degree and no desire to use them um, and moved to Boulder, Colorado to basically like ride my bike and uh, bum around. And that just happened to be during the dot-com uh, boom where they were pretty much pulling anybody with coding experience off the street to, uh, to get into um, uh, startups. So um, the startup called bikestore.com. Uh, I had a friend who worked there. I took a data entry job. Um, day one of my job, I um, was told, hey, looks like you have some coding experience. You're our new developer. Um, and day two of my job, I accidentally deleted a large part of the code base that wasn't backed up. So I spent days three, four, and my three, four, and five of my job learning a new language, coding it, and getting everything back to to normal. And that made me really fall in love with technology in general. The fact that I could so quickly put something out into the world that solved a customer problem um, that could be impactful. Um, that got me into the industry and that really kind of kicked things off for me. Um, I think I quickly learned that I didn't have the right mindset to be a developer or maybe just not the background and training, but um, I started to, because I was in startups and I was wearing a lot of hats and, and working in a, different, a lot of different roles, um, I started to get into project management and operations and learning like if you want to empower engineers to get stuff done, there needs to be good process and good organization. Um, that landed me in Agile. I think everybody who's destined to be a product manager has in the back of their mind um, the sort of mentality where you look at things that are broken in the world, in a company, with a product. You look at these things and you think, I can do this better, I can fix this. And for me, you know, discovering Agile and looking at the way that waterfall processes and companies were so broken, um, that was the sort of catalyst to get into Agile project management. And from there, it was a pretty natural leap into product. Once you've got an engineering team and a product team set up where they're operating efficiently and uh, they're getting a lot of output done, it becomes very, very clear that the problem isn't how fast you're building the things, it's whether or not you're building the right things and solving the right customer problems. And when I identified that that was actually the thing that was broken about these startups, Naturally, that's where I wanted to be. I wanted to learn how to do that. Um, and I was getting into it just at the time, a um, couple of years before Lean Startup came out. So I started out, you know, pro product management used to be very different. This was back in like 2008. Um, it was more like writing specs and requirements and building these ROI documents that maybe um, were based not at all in reality, but just on kind of, uh, if we build it, they will come type mentality. And I sensed that that was broken. And so I went out and discovered lean product management. Um, and that just made so much sense to me. And that's really kind of what I've been driving for each organization that I've worked for ever since. So that's kind of the journey. Um, I understand that, you know, the world is a little bit different today in terms of entry points. Um, so there are many, many different ways to get into PMing, but that was mine. Awesome. That's great. Yeah. And if anyone has any follow-up questions to, to anything David says, be sure to add it and we'll, we'll get it right in, um, right in the flow. Um, a, another question here, um, that we'll kind of, we'd love to kind of dig more into kind of the, the tactics and experience. Um, so in a specific thing here, um, how to, so a question uh, that's being asked here is how to act if you feel that the team is working on the wrong product how to approach mm. a team leader for that. Um, it's definitely a, a challenge that a lot of uh, PMs face. Um, would love to hear more about how you would, uh, how you'd handle that, especially from your experience. I can discuss some general techniques. I think the high level answer is going to be a little unsatisfying, which is it depends. Um, so Blaine, do we have any way for, for, you know, if I were to ask for more information for the, um, the attendee to kind of provide it through the, the Q and A. Yes. Yeah. So, so for any additional information, um, this is a anonymous uh, attendee, but feel free to whoever you are, please feel free to just add another thing and, and just say, 
regarding question that was already asked and that way we can kind of keep the, the thread alive. Okay, so I'll ask some, some follow-up questions and maybe talk about some general techniques while uh, the, the answer is being typed in. So, you know, what, some things I'd wanna learn is, you know, when you say that they're working on the wrong product, um, who made the decision to work on that product? How was it arrived at? Why do you feel it's wrong? And what are the kind of supposed blockers that you're having towards being able to just say, uh, I think this is the wrong thing. In other words, what have you tried and how have you been blocked uh, so far? Um, so I'd be interested in hearing you know, some more information there. Um, while we're typing that in, I can talk a little bit in general about it. Um, I think there are frameworks that really need to be in place in the company in order for this to happen. Um, so, um, one is that there needs to be high level vision, right? So do you have, um, or have you worked with your management to articulate what is the mission and what is the vision of the company? Um, and do you have kind of clear top down mandates for, um, the customer problems that are blocking achieving that mission for each of your teams to work on? Um, and do you have kind of bottom up autonomy to gather data from customers and actually figure out, um, you know, are these problems valid? Are the solutions for them valid? Uh, do you have business intelligence as to say whether or not what you're working on is right or not? Um, so those are some, some things that you really need to build. Um, if you have those, I think, um, there is a, you know, the kind of the best thing to do is to look at your business intelligence, look at what customers are saying, kind of put together a presentation that shows evidence for why it's wrong, um, why it might not be impactful to the mission. Um, if you don't have those, you kind of have to take a step back first and see about building them. Um, so I can, I can drill into a little more detail there, but I can't see, do we have a, a follow-up answer to that yet, Blaine? I am not seeing one yet, but uh, thank you for answering. Yes. Okay. So we do. We, uh, so thank you for answering regarding working on the wrong product. I feel that the team leader is trying to disregard critical business data. He prefers to rely mm -hmm. on certain inputs, disregard others. Yeah. So look, this, <laughs> I have never been at a product event, either as a presenter or an attendee where some form of this question hasn't come up. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read the, uh, Silicon Valley product group, uh, empowered product team, um, and kind of product feature, uh, factory versus, uh, empowered product team blog posts. Um, so, you know, at, at, I, if you haven't, I would recommend reading that and I'll, um, I'll, I can provide a link afterwards, but, um, at the end of the day, um, you kind of have to take, take a step back depending on where you are in the organization. And um, in the same way that you would with a customer, you basically just have to start treating these internal stakeholders like your customers, right? So where are they coming from? Why do they feel like this is uh, the right direction to go? Why are they ignoring certain data? What, who are their stakeholders? Like who are, who are the people who are forcing them down in a certain direction? What are they afraid of? Is it a low risk tolerance? Um, once you, you know, provided that you have, you have access to the data, you put it together. Um, what other pieces of that puzzle are missing? Or, excuse me, what other pieces of that puzzle are missing? Do you have the top down mandate from company leadership? Uh, has your team leader been made clear on what those mandates are? Um, and then, um, provided all those things are in place, one technique is just disagree and commit, right? Um, sit down with that person, understand why they want to go in this direction, talk about risks, um, really try to talk about it from their perspective, right? How can I be successful? Use a lot of yes and. Yes, I see that you want to go this direction. Let's talk about how we can be successful with that. Rather than raising objections, talk about risks. How might we overcome this risk? Um, I've got this data point here um, that's concerning me. How do you feel about this data point? What do you think that means? 
um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, there's only so much you can do, right? Um, the that's sort of a, a tactical way to deal with somebody. I think if you have the power at the company, um, the other way to do it is to just try to kind of step up, not not to wrest control from that person, but to start actually showing them how the way you want to do it could succeed. So don't just say, I'm going to go in this direction because we have data that says that this is the right direction to go. Propose a vision. Say, hey, you know, on my own time, I went and I looked at this data and I have this great idea. Here's the vision. Here's how we can succeed. Here's how this is going to help you towards your goal, which I understand because I've talked to you about it. Here's how it's going to help us meet the company goals. Um, here are the risks. And here's the kind of relative effort we would need from the team. Um, those are techniques you can use. I'll be honest with you, there are a lot of companies where that's just not going to work. And the, the somewhat dissatisfying answer then is just um, you do what you can. You learn what you can from that role. Um, you have to kind of detach yourself a little bit, um, understand that somebody else might be making those decisions. Um, there's a lot to be learned from failure. Um, it's a hard thing to hear because as product managers, we're very, very focused on being successful, delivering customer value. Um, but there is a lot to be learned from seeing things done the wrong way, going out and figuring out how they could have done better. And whether it's your next project or your next role, just applying those learnings. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, uh, if there's any other kind of follow-ups that again, be sure to, to submit them in the chat. Um, thank you for, for your answer there. Uh, David, another question in maybe a little bit different direction. We want to make sure we're covering uh, kind of the breadth of the questions coming in. Um, there are other frameworks within Agile methodology, like Scrum, Kanban, XP, um, et cetera. How are you incorporating Lean into your responsibilities, and do you use other frameworks? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. There are a lot of different frameworks, right? There are frameworks for... Agile processes, there's frameworks within Lean, um, there's Lean UX, there's Google Ventures Design Sprints. Um, the framework doesn't really matter. To me, uh, the way I define Lean is um, it's Agile for the whole company, right? So Agile was a way for the engineering team or maybe the product team to uh, iteratively build a product and put it out and kind of internally have the company decide, okay, I'm gonna make a go, no go decision based on incremental value. Lean is basically saying, no, it's not the company, it's the customer that actually decides when you've iterated to the right incremental value. So Lean is, is actually using the scientific method to say, pose a hypothesis, build a product that's an experiment, keep iterating it until the customer tells you either A, you've got it or, or keep working or you're going, going in the totally wrong direction, you need to pivot because you've misunderstood the problem. So that's just the kind of level set. Lean to me is sort of like, a, it's not different than Agile, it's not a type of Agile. It's really more of like taking Agile out of the engineering team and bringing it into the company in the way that you, uh, the larger product team and business operates. Um, the way I think about specific processes there are, um, there's really, there's four principles to Agile, right? Uh, under the Agile, well, there's 12 principles, but there's four main points in the Agile manifesto. Um, they are um, people, well, working software over comprehensive documentation, um, people and interactions over tools and processes, uh, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. As long as what you're doing kind of adheres to the spirit of those principles, right? It is uh, collaborative. Teams are working together to collectively come up with the best idea and put it forward. Um, it is reliant on the customer to say what's right rather than this like negotiation kind of like fixed requirements process. And it's trying to get software out there and release rather than spending a lot of time uh, documenting. And, and through all of that responding to change, right? Startups, innovation in general is a highly uncertain environment. If you try to control change rather than accept that it's going to happen and have a good framework to respond to it, um, 
then you're going to fail. So I think about Agile as like, you can start with Scrum, you can start with Kanban. Scrum is a little bit easier. Um, you can start with the kind of basic build, measure, learn cycles for lean, put together the basic principles, uh, the basic artifacts of them, but then iterate with your team. What works for you guys? What's broken? What doesn't make sense? Keep adhering to those principles, go online, see what other people are doing. You're probably not the first person to run into the ro specific roadblock that you have. Um, pull any framework that helps. I'll actually, I shared with Blaine before this, a list of frameworks you could look at. Um, but at the end of the day, don't worry so much about, is it Scrum? Is it Kanban? Is it the Lean Startups perfect you know, example of Lean? Um, really deeply understand the principles and why they matter. And you know, then you don't have to so much worry about a framework, you can invent your own. Thank you. Yes. So we do have David uh, um, was able to share kind of a doc with additional resources. That's something we'll be sharing with the group after uh, the event and is kind of a collection of um, different frameworks, uh, other resources to further explore. Um, so we'll be sharing that uh, afterwards. Um, so thank you for your answer. Um, so next question we have here from Julian. Um, I'm a PM at a company that has been primarily tech engineering led. For a while, and now that we're see, we now we find ourselves struggling to find product market fit. Uh, how can I get buy-in from my engineering counterparts as we try to become more product-centric? So PM as a function is relatively new at the company, less than uh, around two years, uh, less than two years. Yeah, um, I suspect that this is kind of a flavor of the other question, which was about how do I stop my team from working on the wrong things. Um, you know, and, and that is a question that comes up, as I said, a lot. And what it boils down to is product managers exist to figure out the right customer problems to solve, to deliver value to the customer, make the business successful that are feasible within your constraints. That's what we do. Um, and a lot of businesses, a lot of organizations don't understand that. They don't support it. Um, lacking that what you really have to focus your time on is building, I, I've referred to these before, but you know, I call them my, my kind of like four pillars, right? So one, do you have good customer outreach? Are you able to go talk to customers, understand what they're using about the product, why they're not using the product, why they are using it, what their problems are? Do you have a good program set up uh, to do that? Um, do you have good business intelligence? Do you have access to data? what products and features are customers using? Where are they dropping off? What are your unit economics? All of that. Those help you put together the picture and the story. The other things you need is, do you have actually like a clear mandate from, uh, from your executive team, right? Um, are they telling you something as high level as just grow the business? Or are they saying, you know, strategically, we think that this is a target market we should be going after. Um, these are some aspects of that market. Um, here are some specific priorities right now we want you to be focused on acquisition over retention, right? Um, those are things that a product management department should be working with leadership to, to do. Um, and the final thing is process, right? Um, process is generally the thing that product managers do get pretty good control of. Um, you know, do you have good agile processes in place so you can iterate rapidly? So the first question is, do you have those things? The second question is, do you have the levers in your hand as a product manager to build those things? Um, if not, which ones are missing? And how can you get those levers? So that's the way I look at the problem. Uh, the techniques for how to get those levers are, I could, I could spend hours talking about them. Um, I did kind of include some, some resources in the list to Blaine in terms of specific books, product leaders, or, you know, techniques and blogs and things like that you can follow in order to understand each of those pillars um, and how to build them at your company and how to get buy-in. So um, I would say, go check those out. Happy to answer follow-up questions afterwards, but um, that's the sort of overall mentality you need is, what are those four pillars at this company? Do they exist? Am I able to build them? Um, if I'm not able to build all of them, am I able to start building some of them, show success there, and then get a little more autonomy to build the rest? That's generally the techniques that I've used to success coming into a new company. Got it. Thank you. 
Um, so the next question we have here is, uh, tell us about a big professional mistake um, you've made and what do you learn uh, from it? We, we of course heard about your code deleting uh, uh, yeah. situation, other, other mistakes to share? Yeah, um, it took me a long time to figure out, uh, you know, I keep referencing these pillars, but like I, I, it took me a long time to figure out how to get those levers in my hand. Um, pretty easy to come into a company and set up good agile processes because I was used to working with engineers um, and you can quickly be successful there. Um, also pretty easy at most companies to set up, you know, customer outreach and with a little bit of elbow grease set up the um, uh, business intelligence that you need. Being able to articulate a vision for the product is not something that there's a lot of literature about, right? Because the whole idea of lean is sort of like, we're working in uncertainty, we don't know, um, we have a hypothesis, we're gonna do these experiments around it, you know, feature roadmaps are not good, deep backlogs are not good, you know, so how do you create a roadmap? Do you just do like a now, next, later? There's been a lot of discussion. Very few people, in my opinion, have done a good job actually talking about how do you put forward a vision so that the company has trust in you and the company knows that like, you're not just experimenting willy nilly. Um, that took me a long time um, to figure out how to do. And that definitely hurt me at some of my early leadership roles. Um, I would recommend, um, there's, a, there's a book called uh, Escaping the Build Trap by Melissa Perry. Um, also, I also included it in the list of, to Blaine, or at least I included a list to her website. Uh, she's a great product thinker. She's a consultant here in New York that helps companies figure out product vision and strategy. And she has some templates and techniques that will help you do the same. Um, I think that really, it helps sales understand, it helps marketing, it helps your business leaders understand that you're not just like the technology person who's here to speak to engineers and set requirements and process. You're actually a business minded person that understands customer value and business strategy um, and are able to talk that language to them. So I would definitely recommend uh, checking those out. Awesome. Um, so next question is around kind of OKRs and, and goals. Um, what is your opinion on quarterly OKRs? What is your recommendation for good planning process? How frequent, um, how to set goals, et cetera? Yeah, I think quarterly and annual OKRs are excellent. Um, and I think product teams should be outcome driven, not output driven, right? So a good OKR should be based on delivering customer or business value or both, right? So, um, you know, an OKR, uh, generally OKRs are in, are in business uh, terms. So um, we're going to, um, our objective might be to um, increase customer value in X area of the product and the key result is gonna be retention, right? So things that actually can be measured um, and things that are aligned with the business goal through delivering customer value are the right OKRs for product. That being said, I've seen a lot of businesses who are at points where they can't do that yet, maybe because it's gonna take more than a quarter to deliver value, maybe because they're doing a refactor and they just have to get something out the door first. I've seen a lot of businesses try to shoehorn an OKR in just because they can measure it, right? So um, sometimes you have to do an OKR that's just like, we're gonna get the MVP out the door by this date. Um, you can, so you can set that as an objective, um, but as key results, you can set something like, um, we're gonna make sure that we have a certain amount of customer conversations around the um, MVP. We're gonna make sure that we get to validated learning around the MVP. Um, I think you have to hack the OKRs a little bit sometimes. A big mistake is trying to, um, just because an OKR should be something that is outcome driven and measurable, um, trying to force something in there just because you can measure it, even if it's a vanity metric, uh, like um, number of releases, things like that. Like try to avoid doing that. Um, look at what your goals are, try to get your goals uh, aligned with your OKRs. If your OKR is quarterly and it has to be quarterly, but you're not gonna be able to meet that goal within the quarter, 
chop that goal up into constituent parts, um, push the ultimate OKR up to the next quarter, and just have some sort of intermediary OKR for this quarter. Great. Thank you. Um, yeah, goals are, are definitely uh, an important part of any organization. So if you guys have any follow-up questions, uh, please be sure to, to add, them in the, add them in the thread. Um, so the next question here is regarding leadership. Um, how would you recommend starting, or rather would you recommend starting a leadership role on a startup's product team or climbing the corporate ladder in a larger organization? Um, so it sounds more about the, the career path and, and what that looks like comparing the two. It really depends on, on what you want and what's right for you. So most larger organizations, I say most, are not going to give you the sort of autonomy that you get at a smaller organization. Um, the trade-off is larger established organizations tend to have more business sense. Um, so often, you know, at, at startups, particularly with first-time founders, um, you've got people who have simply never done this before. Um, maybe they got lucky with a product to hit, or maybe they, they did have a really good idea and, were, and had a really good problem. Um, they're looking to you to drive it forward. Um, you get great autonomy there, provided you've got somebody who's going to give you that autonomy and trust you to move forward with it. Um, to be successful as a PM, you either need good top-down direction or you need autonomy to go and figure out what to do yourself. So at a startup, um, you're often not going to get good top-down direction. Um, make sure you have the autonomy. At a larger organization, um, you are you are likely to get kind of good top-down objectives, but you're going to be more constrained. The exceptions there are, you know, some of your, um, you know, big tech, like the big five companies, Facebook in particular has a reputation for giving a lot of autonomy to PMs. Um, I would say those are your kind of general guidelines, but you don't have to pick one or another. Um, you can, you know, you can take some time and play around, try a startup, go to a large company, see what fits well, see, you know, what resonates with you um, and see what you're good at, you know, see where you actually uh, uh, thrive and, you know, let that inform your decision. So, you know, that's be, that would be my recommendation. Like, don't, don't feel constrained to one or the other. Um, things are flexible. You can always jump around. Maybe you want to start your own startup at some point. So maybe being both at an early stage organization and a later stage organization is going to be helpful. So, you know, what it's going to feel like as your startup grows. So, you know, experiment a little bit and, and see what works for you. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question we have is regarding pivots. So the question here is how do you approach a pivot? If product made a decision in the past, that is no longer the correct decision. How should that decision or kind of next steps be made or communicated to uh, relevant teams? Yeah, so I'd want to ask from the, um, the attendee, um, what is the sort of evidence showing that they were going in the wrong direction and need to pivot? Um, maybe while they're replying, I can, I can speak in some more general terms. Um, I mentioned the principle of responding to change, right? So um, I sincerely hope that every product manager um, is capable of pivoting and accepts a pivot and hopefully works at a company that accepts that as well. Um, very, very rarely does a product, uh, is a product right the first time it's out the door. Sometimes you can iterate to the right thing, but often, particularly early on, you're gonna have to pivot. We just made a wrong choice. And when you're innovating, you have to have tolerance for that uncertainty. Um, you have to be able to, you have to have risk tolerance, essentially. So the best thing to do is to build that tolerance into your process. Make sure that the products you're working on, you're saying, you know, this is a product hypothesis. This is why we're doing this. Share with the rest of the company what your prioritization framework is, what the risks were, what uh, data points might lead to a pivot, and what direction you might pivot, right? That's kind of part of building that product vision. We think this is the right way. This is our assumption. These are the metrics that would bear out the assumption. These are the metrics that would refute it. If it's refuted, here are some additional directions we might go. Setting that up ahead of time is really important. Um, if you haven't, 
you might just have to bite the bullet and say like, hey, we got this wrong. Um, then there's a little bit of repair work you have to do in order to get the organization to understand. Um, they have to understand the difference between we're just going crazy with no plan versus we have a plan. There's uncertainty and risk built into that plan. And here are points at which we're going to measure that uncertainty and risk and course correct. Um, so if you haven't set that structure up already, you have to build that structure. Um, if you've already come to a pivot and you don't have that structure, you're going to have to like do a little bit of uh, mea culpa with your organization, explain that you should have done that and try to get buy-in and trust built back up. And do we have a, awesome. any Thank further you. information on that? On that question? No further information was provided, but uh, uh, so whoever it was an anonymous question. So please be sure to add any additional context uh, for David. Uh, otherwise we'll, we'll be able to um, circle back uh, should you uh, able to provide the info. Um, so the next question uh, we have is around the future of product management. So question here is, how do you think product management will look in the next three to five years? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I'll tell you first a little bit about how I've seen it change over the past uh, even seven years. One is, is just the, the growth, right? When I moved to New York, um, it was still a relatively new product manager. I've been doing it for five years, but only at one company. Um, and there were just very few companies hiring product managers. It still wasn't a discipline that companies had fully embraced. Um, I, I would say that is trending obviously positively. Companies have recognized the, the need for product managers. Um, they still haven't figured out what it is, right? Um, they haven't figured out that product managers are not just order takers. They're not just product marketers, although that can be an important part of the function. Um, they're not just people who uh, detail out business requirements and engineering requirements. You know, product managers really are kind of full stack business strategists, technologists, um, customer advocates, um, business analysts. They're people who can wear a lot of hats and ultimately uh, can help you take complex, uncertain problems, break them down and deliver solutions. Um, more and more companies are starting to figure that out. But even ones that have, it's been my experience talking to them, they, uh, they kind of cycle into being product led then maybe being a little bit more engineering led, you know, uh, product taking things back up. Um, I think the industry is going to start to normalize on that. I think people are going to start recognizing the value of product managers, particularly as uh, I, have a, I have a friend who's a startup founder who was looking for a product leader and struggling. And he said to me, what I found is once a product person gets to a certain level of experience, they just go and found their own company, right? So um, it, I think more and more companies are going to be founded by people who have a background in product and the sort of techniques, the sort of things we're struggling with, right? Finding the right customer problems to solve, iterating, pivoting, working in uncertainty, using good lean techniques. These are going to become you know, canonized at the sort of executive level. Um, and I think it's going to be, uh, I hope, less of a struggle um, for PMs on the ground to, to uh, do good work, essentially. Awesome. Yeah, it's an exciting uh, future for product. Next question here we have is regarding business sense and business instincts. So hmm. from uh, Aya Chan, um, do you have any suggestions for how to learn and internalize business instinct? Um, as well as, you know, within product management that helps kind of inform product roadmaps, increasing growth, managing customer churn, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Um, one is just practice, you know, um, work within the organizations where you are, if, if you're currently acting as a PM, um, find the good leads who have good strategic instincts, um, find the good people who have good kind of operational tactical instincts, you know, learn from them. Um, I would also recommend, um, you know, doing some, some kind of self-learning, uh, looking at, as a product manager, you should understand process and operations. You should understand uh, high level strategy, 
you should understand product strategy. Um, and you really have to understand prioritization and trade-off. Uh, one great way to do this actually is to uh, apply to one of the big five. You know, uh, in particular, I've been through the processes at Google and, and Facebook. Um, they give you a ton of study materials and they really grill you on these questions during the interview process. So, um, you know, and they, and they give you a lot of time to prep, even weeks. So it's almost like a crash course in good product management theory. Um, I can't recommend enough going through that process. Um, I did it for the first time a few years ago and it, it really upped my game um, in terms of, of business sense. So um, that's actually, you know, the, the process itself is one thing, but the resources, the materials, the sort of tangents you'll go off on in, in studying different areas of strategy, it's very, very valuable. Um, and it'll really open your mind to thinking about things in new ways. So I would definitely uh, recommend that as one venue. Great. So the next question we have is regarding uh, data analytics. So how much is uh, data analytics ingrained in product management? How much portion does it take uh, um, of a day-to-day -day responsibility? And are there specific applications or computer languages that you re recommend um, product managers to use or learn, especially as a new product manager? Yeah. So I, I actually taught a course um, in uh, analytics for product managers at, at product school. Um, and I can tell you, it's no secret. You can go on the website and see the, the syllabus. The basic arc of that course is, you know, understanding web analytics, understanding AB testing, um, understanding SQL. Um, and then they go a little bit into like, uh, machine learning and data science. I would say the machine learning and data science stuff, I would almost kind of separate out from, from analytics super useful if that's the field you want to get into. And um, likely in the future, everybody's going to have to understand that uh, as you know, ML becomes a, a larger and larger part of every business. Um, but in terms of your basic groundwork, um, do you need to know SQL? Do you need to know R or Python? No, I would say of the three, a basic ability to run SQL queries is going to really help you with most analytics software, whether you have direct SQL access from Metabase or you have, you know, uh, Tableau or something like that, being able to customize your queries with some basic SQL commands is good. And it's, it's really easy to learn. Um, the most important thing though, is to understand the principles of analytics. Uh, there's a great book, um, by, uh, Alistair crawl. And I can't remember the, the co-author's name, but it's, uh, it's lean analytics. It's one of the lean uh, O'Reilly lean series books. And it, it helps you understand not just how to pull the data, but what metrics are important for what types of companies, what business models, what stages. Um, that's really the ground stuff that you need to understand. You could end up working at a company where you have a business analyst and they could pull all the data with you, where you already have a pretty robust analytics package. If you don't think you're ever going to be comfortable with SQL, you can still be a product manager. But you do have to understand the principles of, uh, of metrics. And I would, I would start there uh, with lean, lean analytics. Um, if you're already working as a product manager, I would just Google, you know, if you're a SaaS company, Google analytics for SaaS. If you're a um, uh, e-commerce company, Google analytics for e-commerce and just start educating yourself on that. Once you understand the principles, it's really just a matter of figuring out like what data points do I need to pull and how do I pull them? Um, and did that, was there another part of that question? I think it was about analytics in general and uh, techniques or software yes. playing. Did I miss any, any part of that? Uh, bear with me. Um, so part of it was also around um, how that kind of factors into your day to day. Is mm. that something yeah. that is, you know, takes half the day, maybe a couple hours out of the day. Yeah. That's variable depending on type of company stage and other employees, right? So um, if you're working at a big company where you have a business analyst, um, it might take up less time in terms of actually pulling the data, um, but you're gonna be spending a lot of time analyzing and reviewing the data. Um, it's probably going to take up a lot of the time, you know, if you're doing good build, measure, learn cycles and you're at the point where you put something out and you need to actually see how it did, you know, that's going to take up a good bit of your time, um, actually like compiling the analytics, 
or if you're kind of trying to explore a new product area and you want to just look at the data, you want to see the health of your different systems, you want to see the, where the opportunities are, you might be dedicating a couple of days, you know, or, or, or spare time over a week or so to really like diving into the data. Um, you'll become more conversant and you'll become quicker with it as you do that. The biggest thing is if you actually have to build your own business analytics platform. Um, I had to do that when I was the first product person at Ovation Tix. Um, it involved a lot of Excel and a lot of overtime um, and a lot of grunt work. I, mean, I think I literally combed through 15,000 lines of Excel and like deduped them. So it can be, you know, it can be really thorny, um, but it depends on the organization. And I don't think you have to worry if you're, you know, if you're the type of product manager that feels like I don't really want to be an analyst. I don't really want to be pulling data. Um, I don't feel like, you know, SQL is, is necessarily something I'm comfortable with. Um, there's still roles for you, right? It's just a matter of finding a place where business intelligence is already pretty, pretty well built up and you'll be spending less time uh, pulling the data and more time just reviewing and, and analyzing and understanding it. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question we have here is more about your own career path. Um, so the question here is, can you talk more about your own career path uh, how you got into certain product roles and what challenges um, or what challenged you in the main ones and what you took away from them? Yeah. So, you know, it's an interesting question. Um, I mentioned initially getting into product because that was the interesting problem to solve um, at Napster. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, when I moved to New York, there just weren't that many product roles available. Um, I took a job at American Express, which is a great opportunity and a great company, but I took it with them at a time where, you know, they were very excited to bring in, you know, like a quote unquote startup person uh, because they were really looking to pivot the company. But I think they weren't really ready at that time. It takes a long time to pivot a 60,000 person company um, in terms of their processes. They weren't really ready to adopt good agile processes. They were very top down. Um, they've made a lot of changes. They're a really smart company. And they, I think they're, they're a much different place to work as a product manager. But when I was there, it was really more of a project management role. And so um, I was given the opportunity uh, to be first in uh, product manager at an existing company that had sort of, um, they'd been early entering into a space because they hadn't focused on the product enough as competition ramped up, their growth had been stymied. And I was brought in to build a product team build a product discipline and help turn them around. So um, that's the path I took. Some people take the path of like, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna find a company where product management is going really well. And I'm gonna kind of apprentice myself there and I'm gonna learn it. I took the path of, um, well, I'm having a hard time finding that. So I'm just gonna go to a place that's gonna let me define what product management is. And, you know, I failed at a lot of things. Um, I had a lot of successes as well. Um, I learned a ton. I don't regret uh, taking that route, but it's not the only route these days. There are plenty of places that are doing good product management um, where you can go in at anywhere from a junior to a, to a senior level um, and really learn from people who are, who are already doing things well. Awesome. And so I, I think maybe to, to kind of add on to that, just to kind of cover more context from your your career so far. So um, can you talk a little bit more about your uh, your most recent roles and kind of what's uh, next on the horizon for you? Yeah, sure. So um, I'll go back a couple of roles and just kind of give you give you an arc. I, I had just left Ovation Tix um, when we had successfully gotten the company sold off. That was the one I mentioned where I was kind of first in product person. Um, I was very excited to have an opportunity to take uh, a, a product director role, you know, only product hire at a very, very early seed round startup uh, called Work.co, social mission focused startup, uh, recently acquired uh, as well in March. Um, this was a rare opportunity. Usually, I think I was hiring over 10 or 11. Usually at that point, the founders do product decisions. These were two extremely smart founders, uh, you know, kind of good um, marketing, PR, and business sense. They knew that they didn't have product or technical acumen, um, and they were bringing somebody in to help out. So um, for me, I felt like this is a, 
I eventually want to move into my own startup. This was a way to get in early at the ground floor, practice that, um, learn from some people that had really good business acumen and advance a really exciting uh, socially driven product, uh, which is something I care about a lot. Uh, Work's mission was actually to increase uh, diversity and inclusion in the workplace by introducing the idea of structured flexibility. Um, just kind of in brief, uh, the world's changed a lot in the past few months in terms of being able to work from home. But until a few months ago, anyone who had uh, illness in the family, children, el uh, elderly relatives they needed to take care of, in short, people who tended to be more experienced or from more diverse backgrounds um, that didn't have the same sort of flexibility that maybe someone who looks like me might have, um, those folks really needed structured flexibility in work. Um, they need to be able to work from home. They needed to be able to um, uh, change their hours. They needed to be able to have flexibility to leave for appointments and, and pick up their kids and then come back in. Um, and so this was a, a first experience where I got to go in to a business that really was just an idea and an MVP and work with the founders to figure out how are we actually going to translate this into an enterprise product um, that changes hearts and minds, removes bias, um, puts this flexibility in a structured way into the workplace. And that was just a whole new challenge to me, um, you know, moving away from actual, the actual just like, what do we build uh, on? What, what's the next new feature? You know, how do we increase growth in this area into actually, um, how do we get people to change their mindset? How do we create a product that helps people uh, make a cultural shift? Um, so that to me really got me thinking about starting my own startup. Um, you know, unfortunately, when you start a seed round startup, there's limited funding. Um, so, you know, that was kind of a, I came in, I got them set up and I left for Remesh, um, which also is a social mission focused startup. Um, they exist to help people understand one another. They're basically a platform where people can go and reach consensus. You know, very, very important during the time of, um, you know, elections and misinformation and deep divisions. They're a startup that's actually focused to um, fostering conversations on their platform that help people kind of align and come together. So, you know, long story short in that arc, I look for companies that are social mission driven. Um, and I've looked for opportunities at various stages, right? More established companies, very, very early stage. Remesh was a, a series A to series B. Um, what I'm thinking of right now is I'm, act I'm actually going through the process with some of the big five companies, focusing on the ones that I feel have a, have a kind of stronger uh, mission focus and looking to see how do I succeed as a PM um, within that established organization within a structure, within a company that has already got massive scale and it's got massive reach, um, but they're still solving big problems. So um, I am still, even at this point in my career, jumping around and trying different things, uh, again, with the ultimate goal of uh, understanding the full spectrum so I can start my own uh, startup eventually. Awesome. Yeah, we, uh, we appreciate the additional context. Um, Another question here we have is regarding kind of building skills um, that are PM focused. So how would you recommend building skills that are focused around product management or currently employed in a role in company that is not product related? So it sounds like someone who's interested in trying to break into the product space, but might not have those immediate opportunities at their current role. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a great way to, to break into PM by doing a lateral move from a company that has a, a PM function. So I'm, I'm assuming that there is a uh, PM function at the company. Um, if there is, I would say um, make your wishes known to the, the product leader in the company, um, or if not the product leader, someone who you have a, a kind of a strong relationship with, someone who's an ally, um, start to learn from them, um, figure out ways that your department interacts with product and, um, you know, see if you can kind of strengthen that. Uh, what information is product giving to you to help you do your job? What information are you giving to them? What are the learning opportunities there? Um, and how can you start to involve yourself more? Are you going to daily standups? Are you going to the design meetings? Um, can you 
you know, just even just have lunch with those folks and, and learn more about what they're doing. So um, I think that's a great way. If there isn't an established product function at your role, who is doing that? Like who is deciding um, what to build, what customer problems to solve? How are they doing it? And how might you able, how might you be able to basically step into that vacuum of lack of product and maybe start suggesting how you might improve things. One thing I did at Napster um, in order to promote lean product management was I literally got on the phone with almost everybody at the company um, and just started asking them questions. I used the same sort of interview techniques that product managers use for customers. And I said, hey, what's going on at the company for you? What are the roadblocks that you are seeing? Um, I got some buy-in from kind of senior leadership to do this. Uh, and then I just presented, hey, here's some things that are going on at the company that you might not know about. Here's how product management as a function might help. And here's some things that I can do to um, help get us there. So you know, that's what I would recommend if product is not an established function. But if it is, um, definitely reach out to that team and make your wishes known and see how you can collaborate with them. I think you'll find most product people are, are really interested in kind of bringing, bringing more people into the fold. Awesome. Great. So the next question we here have here is, is kind of on a similar vein, um, as an aspiring PM, are case studies and building product concepts an effective way to communicate your skills to prospective employers? I don't have strong coding skills, so beyond HTML and CSS, so I can't build functioning apps. What, uh, what would you recommend? Yeah, I think case studies are good. I think um, I don't do it nearly enough, but blogging is good. You know, um, what, what are the things that you have experienced in a startup that might be useful that other people could learn from? Um, essentially, just like take the behavioral interview questions, right? Tell me about a project that failed. Tell me about a risk you took. Tell me about a time you collaborated and like put those stories out online. Put out content that you feel will help um, kind of some, some junior folks. Um, you know, tweet about your experiences, whatever medium you're, you're comfortable um, sharing them in. Um, you know, I think as long as you have something to say, you have a perspective, you have unique experiences that you feel people could benefit from, um, go and put them out there. Um, I think it's also good if you want to put together case studies, if you want to put together some sort of portfolio similar to a product designer, um, you could even put down like, you know, pictures of the whiteboard, pictures of the, uh, post-it notes you did during affinity mapping. I think those things can be really helpful to showing prospective employers that you kind of have a, a basic uh, product acumen and product skill set. Um, the other thing is just what does your resume look like? Um, is it outcome focused? Does it have metrics on it? Does it show that you understand the importance of understanding customers and understanding customer value? That it's not about releasing features, it's about moving a lever, moving a needle for the team. Um, you know, if you need help with resumes, there are plenty of people who can help you do that. Um, but I would definitely run your resume by an experienced product person who can um, maybe help you uh, bring that out um, and, and help you kind of showcase yourself to an employer better. Awesome. Uh, another question we have here is in what should product invest, uh, product leaders and product managers in general invest more time in and as well as spend less time on. Um, so in kind of the product uh, organization in general, from what you've seen, what needs more attention and uh, what gets too much attention? That's a good question. I think related to kind of the earlier questions um, that, that were asked around, like how do I convince uh, a company or an engineering team to kind of let product take a more active role in deciding what to build. Um, I think in the industry, there's still a lot of focus on execution, right? Getting stuff out the door and not enough attention on um, how do we marry company strategy to product strategy? Um, how do we push down OKRs to the teams? And how do we let them um, figure out what to build you know, how do we basically build a company um, that supports good product development? Um, you know, I think that is, that's probably the primary area. Um, that being said, I think 
what you should be focusing on more personally and what you should be focusing on less personally, th that is a highly personal decision. Every single direct report who I have uh, come to me, um, you know, when, when I start a new role or somebody is hired, one of the first things I tell them to do is I say, make a Venn diagram, what I'm good at, um, what I want to do more of, and what I want to do less of, right? And you should try to gear your job where you're doing 80% things that you are good at and want to do more of, or not good at yet, but want to do more. So 80% should be in the want to do more of, probably with the majority of that stuff that you're already good at, but a good mix of things that you want to get good at. 20% um, or less of your role should be things that you're good at, but want to do less of, and stuff that you're not good at and want to do less of, just don't work on. Um, why that's important is a lot of people make the mistake, this gets back to the, the earlier question about resumes, right? Um, a lot of people make the mistake of just putting everything they're good at on a resume. I've done this, I've accomplished this. If an employer sees something on your resume that you've been successful at and it's not something you want to do, they're going to hire you to do that thing because you advertised it. So just take that off your resume. Don't be afraid that you might miss out on a job. You know, you're, you're skilled, you're qualified people. Put the successes on your resume that are things that you want to um, advance, things that you want to learn more about, um, and really think deeply in your career about what those things are and work with your kind of direct reports, your managers to make sure that there's a plan in place so that you're, you're getting that learning and that you're able to focus. I, you know, I can't stress that enough. Like pay very close attention in your career to the things that you just don't want to do, whether you're good at them or not. Awesome. That's great feedback. Um, we have another question here about kind of more of the senior level of products. So at the more senior level, what differentiates the most market desirable product leaders? So what separates the, the best of the best? Hmm. Um, I think the, the people who are best at product management, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about people who, uh, who are you know way better than me um because you know i think i have i have a, a enough experience and and skill to be at a fairly senior level but i don't pretend to be the best pm or pm leader out there you know by any means um the people who have really impressed me um possess a skill to get to the heart of the matter very very quickly basically to just cut to the chase um some of that is their personality and some of that is their experience. They've just, they've just bumped up into the situation so many times before um, that they're able to kind of like really quickly get there. So, um, you know, they'll walk into a meeting. Um, they'll see a few, you know, high level, high level bits of information about um, business intelligence, customer data, and they'll just quickly be able to say, we don't have product market fit there. Um, you know, it's pretty clear that this is the customer problem. This is my hypothesis. I'll go out and dig some evidence on this, but they've sort of built that intuition uh, through experience and through, I, I think, just a certain inherent uh, analytical capability um, where they, uh, they know and they sense what's wrong, what needs to be built, what customer problems are, what needs to be fixed before the data can even be supplied. Um, so they've just they've just got that natural ability that's been attuned uh, and fine tuned over the years to be taking in data at all times from different sources. Um, I think it's hard to get there without experience, right? Until you've sort of been there, done that at all stages and all types of startups, uh, it's hard to know that. Um, I worked with one or two people who are just naturally good at that, even though they've only been in the field for you know three to five years, but. I think that's sort of a standout quality that you, you tend to develop over time. Awesome. Uh, so a question we had uh, as well here is currently working from Ashley, currently working for a tech consulting firm where the BA role, um, I'm assuming business analyst role lives within the PMO, so product management office or organization. Does, mm -hmm. does that role typically belong on the, the product team or a separate kind of product strategy team um, 
either from your experience, um, and it might be more industry specific. So um, I want to make sure that the uh, question was, uh, was asked as well. So I've only ever worked with business analysts at American Express. Um, and there they live within, you know, I would say American Express, as I mentioned at the time, hadn't really organized into true cross-functional teams. So product designers, product managers, product marketers, and business analysts all worked in um, kind of a strategic operations as a, as a business unit. Um, I think that business unit would, would probably these days be more likely to be called the, you know, the product department. Um, so I think that business analysts in general um, do belong either on a cross-functional team as part of a product department, um, but it really depends on the organization and the goals, right? So a good product team has a mandate and then they have everything they need to reach that mandate. And if you need a business analyst and that business analyst is not on your cross-functional team and is somebody who you have to go and fight you know, with other teams and, and resources and timing, that's probably not going to work. Um, if what you mean by does it, does the business analyst live within the product management organization is if what you mean by that is should the product manager also have to be a business analyst? I've usually had to be a business analyst. So um, it's nice, I guess, when you can work for an organization where somebody else can pull up the data for you, um, particularly because I've worked at smaller organizations, I've had to. So, you know, just kind of long, long story short there, like, yes, I do think that uh, the BA should be part of the product organization, whether it's a separate role, whether you're doing it, um, at the end of the day, access to that information has to live within the product organization. And it can't be constrained by having to fight for resources. That's the thing that you need to really optimize for. Awesome, thank you. And we have one last question. Um, and for anyone who hasn't, uh, uh, hasn't gotten a chance to ask a question, um, we'll be able to continue the conversation offline. But the last question for the evening um, we have here is, how easy is it to cross over from one vertical to another? So for example, medical to finance, to real estate, um, B2C, um, B2B, et cetera. Um, and generally, I found it pretty easy. If you look at my LinkedIn profile, um, I have worked in the employment industry, you know, helping find people jobs or, or basically HR industry twice. Um, but apart from that overlap, I have worked in um, online consumer marketing and retail for the bicycle industry. I've worked in uh, the job search industry. I've worked in um, not-for-profit CRM, uh, SaaS platforms, um, digital streaming music, uh, finance when I was at Amex, um, a SaaS theater management platform uh, and, and ticketing company. Uh, and then uh, at work.co, the more socially focused uh, employment company, um, and then at Remesh, which was uh, uh, ML-based um, social collaboration and marketing research company. So um, I have very rarely worked in the same industry twice. Um, that's because I'm pretty industry agnostic. I feel like um, as long as it's an interesting problem to solve, um, I'll work for the company. I'll say caveat to that. There are some jobs, usually they say experience in this industry is a bonus. There are some industries that are harder break, to break into. Ad tech is a little bit harder. Very, very technical. Um, like if you wanted to work for Google Cloud Platform, Amazon Web Services, um, you know, a product where the customer is very technical can be hard to break into if you don't have those skills. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm finding right now because of the current, you know, uh, market situation with so many product people and product leaders um, kind of leaving startups uh, that are um, that are going under um, it is a little bit harder just because there's more choice right and if a company has a choice between two highly skilled product people one of whom has industry experience and the other one doesn't they're going to choose the one with industry experience most of the time in my career that has not been the case um, Right now, I think a little bit more than usual it has been, but um, 
I would not uh, let that deter you from trying to change industries if you want to, um, or from jumping around from industries if you feel like you want to try a few different things. I don't think it's going to hurt your career in the long run. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, so, so with that, um, we're about at time. Um, however, we want to make sure that uh, we're able to kind of continue the conversation. Uh, uh, David, it, what do you recommend um, to, to the, the attendees if they had kind of follow-up questions, um, if they want to take the conversation further? Um, sure. Um, I will get alerts if you reply to, um, so I'm a member of the, um, of the meetup group. Uh, for the product, the PM Festival. Um, so if you um, if you reach out and find me there and message me, um, I'll I'll get that alert and I can uh, I can respond to you there. Um, or you know, Blaine, if you if you want people to reach out to you and and you can kind of funnel them to me and, as well. Um, I'm generally pretty happy to connect with people on LinkedIn as well. If you have um, you know. I generally will accept a connection if we've actually had a conversation and talked and I know who you are and, and all of that. So um, if you want to talk further, just go ahead and reach out. I'm always happy to talk product with folks. Awesome. And of course, as mentioned, uh, David uh, put together a kind of a list of resources that uh, he wanted to share with the, the group. Um, a lot of awesome content regarding kind of continuing reading, um, different uh, blogs to follow and uh, resources to explore. So. We'll be sharing that with the group. Um, we're gonna be posting it in the message thread uh, for the event. Um, and we'll be able to uh, kind of carry the conversation uh, from there. So again, we'd love to thank you, David, for taking the time to join us here. Um, we hope everyone enjoyed the conversation. I know I sure did, a lot of awesome uh, you know, questions and answers. Um, it's really great to see your experience, David, and um, I'm really glad uh, for you to have joined us tonight. So um, without further ado, I, I appreciate everyone attending. Um, thank you, David, again. And any, any final words uh, from yourself? Um, just, you know, thanks for, for letting me speak. It was really great to, to kind of be able to reach out. Like I said, I always love chatting about product and feel free everyone to, to reach out with any follow-up you have. Awesome, great. Thank you again. And uh, we wish uh, everyone a good night and we're excited to continue on with the future events. So, awesome. Cool. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Have a good one.